Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis, part of New America Local. We're so glad to welcome you today to the third installment of our Urban America Forward Equitable Relief and Recovery Series, looking at racially equitable practices in the COVID-19 era. We're so excited to be welcome, uh, to be joined by and to welcome our esteemed panel today and also to welcome all of you in the audience. As Angela and Narmada said, please do engage with us in the chat and help us take the conversation online using the hashtag Urban America Relief. At New America Local, we're so pleased to join Urban America Forward and our partners, the National Urban League, in promoting this series because we focus on racial equity and economic justice. And there's probably never been a more important time to have that conversation. It's my honor to introduce our uh, host today and my partner, Elena Beverly, Assistant Vice President for Urban Affairs at the University of Chicago and the head of Urban America Forward. Elena, I'll turn it over to you. And there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Welcome everyone to Urban America Forward COVID-19 Equitable Relief and Recovery. Uh, thank you for joining us for this third in our four-part series. I want to thank our partners, New America Local uh, and the National Urban League, as well as our generous sponsors. They've really been with the Urban America Forward program from the beginning. That's the NEE Casey Foundation and the Kresge Foundation. Urban America Forward is an initiative of the University of Chicago Office of Civic Engagement. We launched in 2015 uh, and have been an annual program in person. Uh, the goal of Urban America Forward is and always has been to bring together experts across a range of disciplines, each of whom are, uh, are co uh, committed and uh, have an opportunity to get them to share their approaches to advancing equity in America's cities. Urban America Forward furthers one of the university's goals of advancing inquiry and impact in uh, urban areas in America and across the globe. We specifically designed this webinar series uh, to bring together practitioner experts across the country uh, in order to share their efforts and their learnings in this critical time uh, addressing COVID-19 impacts. And we know that COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our communities. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated existing racial inequalities and disparities, and has taken a disproportionate toll on uh, African-American and Latino communities in America's cities. As we navigate these dual pandemics of racial injustice and the impacts of COVID-19, we thought it important to come together and share both our efforts for uh, equitable relief, as well as how to envision uh, a, a way forward that includes a more inclusive recovery. This program seeks to begin walking us down that road. Uh, and so the, this equitable relief and recovery webinar series brings together practitioner experts in eight cities to share their experiences, uh, the partnerships that have been developed, the challenges that you've experienced and the lessons learned. Uh, and all of this is work that prioritizes racial equity in the COVID-19 relief and response. So let me outline our program today. Uh, we will begin with our distinguished speaker uh, who will provide context and table setting and provide uh, the, the background for this important discussion. And next, we will have a panel of experts who will delve a bit more deeply into their experiences their challenges and lessons learned in this work. Speakers will then ask questions of each other in an effort to promote a dialogue amongst our practitioner experts. And then finally, we'll have Q&A from our audience participants. Uh, so thank you for uh, engaging in this discussion. The Q&A will be curated by New America Local and will be shared with us um, as a group uh, toward the end of our program. Now to kick us off, I am thrilled to introduce Karen Freeman Wilson. She is the president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. The Chicago Urban League is dedicated to uh, advancing economic, educational, and social progress for African Americans and promote strong, sustainable communities through advocacy, collaboration, and innovation. Having served in the public arena for most of her professional life, 
Karen has deep experience in serving urban communities and addressing the challenges that confront urban life. She was previously the mayor of, of her hometown, Gary, Indiana, from 2012 to 2019. And I had an opportunity to work with her closely during, during that time, during her tenure as mayor. Uh, I know her to be uh, a visionary leader and committed to resilience. And it's that commitment that has helped her garner a national, a national reputation uh, for, for her leadership. It's also important to note that Karen was the first female to lead the city of Gary and the first African-American female mayor in Indiana. Without further ado, Karen Freeman Wilson. Good afternoon. It is my distinct honor and ple pleasure to join all of you, particularly our um, panelists today and those of you who are sponsors. Um, I am excited to hear about the panel, so I will not be uh, unusually long. I am going to get out of your way. But I think the discussion that we're having today is so important, not in the context only of, of what has happened and what we observed, but how do we recover? In fact, how do we transform uh, as communities across this country. Uh, I can remember a conversation that our team had in our conference room before we began working remotely. And as we thought about the impact of COVID-19 on the city of Chicago and on our work, we were very concerned about two areas, and those areas were healthcare and education. Healthcare, because obviously COVID um, was directly related to health because it was, in fact, a, um, a health related illness. But education, because we knew that as schools were making the very difficult but necessary decision to go remote that some young people would be left behind. And it was during this time that the decision to commission a report that would help us to quantify what we feared would happen was done. And the result of that um, report was a publication that you will find on our website at shyul.org, which is an epidemic of inequities, structural racism, and COVID-19 in the Black community. And while this report largely focuses on the Black community in Chicago, many of the tenants that you will find in the report really are relevant throughout the United States. And we would certainly um, invite you to take a look at that. And so I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the risks that were found in the report or outlined in the report. And that is the risk to not only uh, contracting COVID-19, but also the risk of mortality from the disease. I'm going to also outline how we hope the report will help us in Chicago and in communities throughout this country, not to just um, recover, because we know that recovery is important, but also to transform and really uh, create a better framework for citizens, particularly those who are poor and who are disadvantaged. Uh, finally, I hope that we can outline what uh, partnerships look like going forward, because after all, we're talking about partnerships today. And I think that that is going to really be important about transformation. So let's talk first about the uh, risk for infection. What are some of those factors that made Black folks, uh, and I would argue are uh, uh, Latino brothers and sisters, more uh, at risk for infection? 
the first was employment. Uh, they were more likely, we were more likely to be essential workers. Uh, when many folks were able to um, work from home and began working remotely, um, black folks were overrepresented in grocery stores, in uh, health environments, in uh, those jobs, uh, public transportation, and other jobs that simply didn't have the ability or the luxury of saying, I'm going to work from home now because they were identified as essential workers. So often when people think about essential workers, they think immediately about doctors and nurses. They forget about those who work in healthcare institutions, in the cafeteria, in the laundry, uh, as CNAs and other essential workers, but also those individuals who work outside of the uh, healthcare industry, who work in prisons um, as uh, prison guards, who work in other places that were deemed to be essential to the uh, continuation of, of business uh, in society. And so even though restaurants and other places shut down, uh, the public transportation and others continued. And I think you found particularly in our urban communities an overrepresentation of black and brown people in those vocations. The second risk was housing. Um, you know, so often when one person was diagnosed with COVID-19, that meant that they had to quarantine themselves within their own home. That meant they may have gone to the basement or they may have gone to one room and they would not use the bathroom that others in their homes used. If uh, in many instances, black folks didn't have that option, black and brown people, uh, there's only one bathroom perhaps in the home or uh, people are sharing rooms and you have multi-generational families living in. So you might have had someone who had contracted COVID-19 with a grandparent, living with a grandparent or an older relative. And so those limitations meant that it was more likely than not that everyone in the household might in fact test positive as a result of the disease. Another factor was the um, fact that many folks in the black and brown community did not have the ability to socially distance, not just at home, but for so many you found that there was an option of ordering food out, of doing so many things on the internet, like your banking, like many of the other um, services and goods that you might otherwise get outside the home. But if you didn't have access to reliable internet, if you didn't have access to those um, options that would allow you to socially distance, then you found that you had to go to, bank, to the bank. You had to go to the store. You had to go to restaurants to order. And that in fact uh, made it more likely that you would be infected. And then finally, the uh, factor that we lifted up as an increased opportunity to become infected with COVID-19 was mass incarceration. And of course, that speaks for itself. What about the likelihood of death from COVID-19? Uh, the first was the uh, discriminatory uh, discrimination that you find in healthcare and access to healthcare. Um, I had this experience myself. I went to the emergency room twice and was never diagnosed with COVID-19 until I went and insisted on getting a test. Uh, so there's more likely, there's a greater likelihood to dismiss it as something that might not have been the coronavirus. Uh, the hyper segregation that we see in our communities make 
it more likely that black and brown people were to die from COVID-19. Uh, the incidence of living in poverty uh, and the income disparity uh, made it more likely for people uh, who might die from COVID-19. And environmental contaminants, the fact that uh, you might have lived in a moldy house and that moldy house may make you more susceptible for re from, to respiratory diseases had an impact. And then of course, the pre-existing conditions that um, were talked about very early on uh, during the epidemic, but not, uh, there weren't as much, uh, there weren't, people who talked about it weren't as likely to acknowledge that those pre-existing conditions come from living in food deserts, come from uh, the environmental injustice that we uh, experience and many other factors that were not just a, a fact or a factor or a result of unhealthy eating. And so what does all of this mean? I would suggest to you that it means uh, a couple of things. It means that as we look in our communities to transform as a result of COVID-19 and quite frankly, as a result of the racial justice and injustice that we've seen in our communities, we need to think about how do we rebuild and how are we able to make um, decisions that impact employment opportunities, that impact housing opportunities, that impact access to healthcare? What, do, what does uh, equity look like now that we take these factors into consideration and how can we make our societies more just and more equitable? And I would suggest that one of the prime ways for doing that is to build broader coalitions. One of the benefits we have seen as a result of the social unrest that we've seen all across the United States is that corporate America is becoming more in tuned to the impact of structural racism. But they're not just becoming more attuned to it. They're saying, what is our role in helping to dismantle it? Uh, what is the role of philanthropy in helping to dismantle structural racism? And we've certainly seen that in the city of Chicago as the Chicago Community Trust has made reducing the wealth gap one of their primary goals and one of their primary funding focus points. The last, the other thing that we've seen is government being engaged in a way and across partnerships so that they have uh, made grants to micro businesses. They have made grants to those who have experienced uh, housing insecurity. And they are not only providing those grants, but they are providing the technical assistance through advice from nonprofit organizations and both the National Urban League as well as local affiliates have been heavily engaged in this movement. Uh, with every crisis, with every challenge, comes an opportunity. And I would argue that out of the challenge uh, and epidemic or the pandemic of COVID-19 and the epidemic that we have seen um, in terms of the racial injustice and the social unrest that have come from that has been an opportunity to really rethink how we engage citizens at every socioeconomic level of every race and culture. And not only how do we engage those citizens, but what is it that we can do collectively 
across sectors to create better opportunities for these citizens to have a better quality of life. And I will tell you that has been our laser focus at the Chicago Urban League and certainly uh, at the National Urban League. And it has been an honor to work uh, with the University of Chicago as we uh, engage in this work. And uh, we look forward to doing that here in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Karen Freeman Wilson, everyone, thank you so much for so eloquently laying out all of the many uh, risk factors uh, that contributed to uh, the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Uh, and thank you for, ha for highlighting the importance of partnerships um, across sector uh, for, that, for dismantling uh, structural racism and also for achieving the type of transformation that we all believe and hope and believe is possible. So now we're gonna to turn to our panel of experts to delve a bit more deeply into the question of how to leverage public-private pri partnerships to marshal equitable re relief uh, in response to COVID-19 for some of our hardest hit communities. We have so much important content to discuss that I am going to simply introduce our panelists by their name and title as opposed to uh, their robust biographies, but you should have received information about their biographies in an uh, in, in email in advance of this program, and they are also will, you will also be available online. So to start us off, it's my honor to welcome my friend Daniel Ash, who is the Associate Vice President of Community Impact at the Chicago Community Trust. Franklin Baker, who's the President and CEO of the United Way of Central Maryland. Ellis Carr, also a dear friend, President and CEO of Capital Impact Partners. Pam Lewis, who is the Director of the New Economy Initiative in Detroit. Milton J. Little Jr., who is President and CEO of the United Way of Greater Atlanta. Carmen James Randolph, who is the President of Programs at the New Orleans Foundation. And Carmen is bracing for a storm to come to her area. Uh, so we are very grateful that she's taking the time to be with us today. And Joanne Stately, the Director of Impact Strategies for Economic Vitality at the Minneapolis Foundation. We're thrilled that each of you have taken the time to join us. So let me start off uh, by asking Daniel, Daniel Ash. Um, partnerships are critical in this time of relief efforts, rapid relief efforts for COVID-19. Can you tell us a bit about the Chicago Community Trust partnerships and what you prioritized in COVID-19 relief to date? Thank you, um, Elena. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to be here um, with all of you today. Um, so there, there are two characteristics that, that, that sort of distinguish sort of the response here in Chicago and Karen touched on them. Um, one, it was collaborative, um, swift and strategic. And Elena, with your question about partnerships <clears throat> really leads into the importance of collaboration. Um, the trust recognized this sort of, you, what we would argue is our unique sort of convening power, the ability to bring government, philanthropy, the nonprofit sector, community, corporate together and respond together. Um, we recognize that, quite frankly, th some of these alliances did not exist. And if they did exist, they may not have been sort of rich in trust. Um, but this was an opportunity for us to solve for that. Um, as, as, as many folks like to say, there's nothing like a sort of good crisis to get folks in the room to start getting to know one another. So we were very intentional about sort of leveraging that and working with our partners. We have a lot of United Way folks um, here the local United Way and working with <clears throat> other sort of key stakeholders to sort of make that happen. Um, strategic, I want to underscore that point and, 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 and make sort of two context setting sort of remarks. One, um, we wanted to be intentional about activating existing infrastructure. Um, and this is sometimes I think philanthropy you lose sight of, you make investments year over year over year. In a moment where there's great need, sometimes there's this tendency to step back and say, oh, we got to create something new. 
and what we what we were intentional about is making sure that we um, built on the assets that we had invested in and others had invested in um, over many many decades, um, and then we sort of used this moment to sort of lift up bold ideas. So this is this is opportunity to not test an idea, um, not research an idea, but go to market with um, ideas that we've been sort of toying with for years. For example, the idea of financing um, direct ca cash transfers in the moment of need made sense, right? And we were able to do that. Um, in terms of priority setting, I want to make a, a, again a couple of context setting remarks. One, we had to prioritize for the, all geography with a uh, specific focus on black and brown communities. Um, that was absolutely key. We also prioritize all relevant sort of sectors. Um, so in addition to large scale response funds, one set up for the city and the metro area, one set up for the rest of Illinois, um, we set up, the local community here set up funds that were targeted at various subsectors. For example, we had a fund set up for, to support community organizers. A fund was set up to support the arts community. A fund was set up to support journalism. Um, and each of these sort of funds had sort of a steering committee made up of sort of the members of the stakeholder groups that I mentioned earlier. Um, a couple of points I wanna sort of make in closing. One, we made a commitment in the moment of crisis to learn together. So the larger funds that were created, created a, um, we created a weekly opportunity for those leaders, those steering committee members, those investors to come together and learn about what was going on. Um, so that was an opportunity to bring someone like um, Karen in to make sure that when, so the, the equity sort of impact that was emerging, you know, we didn't wait to hear about that two, three, four weeks later, we heard about it real time because those folks were at the table. Um, in addition to sort of learning in the moment, we've now sort of pivoted to continuing to work together. So the same type of synergy that drove the rapid response, the emergency response must drive the recovery. And uh, again, Mayor um, sort of Wilson sort of, uh, sort of uh, touched on this a few moments ago. Um, last point I wanna make. One, um, we, we are standing up a recovery fund. Um, and that recovery fund essentially will be fueled by the assets and relationships that were developed during the emergency response. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to um, think and, and with the same spirit of urgency that we need to get things done like in this city. And in order to get things done, we have to keep these relationships intact. Um, so, so, as, so one thing that is important to us as we sort of walk away from the sort of basic human needs response, we're understanding that we have to leverage that momentum as we move um, forward. I'll stop there and let you sort of move to the next panelist. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for that framing. You brought up so many important themes that I'm certain are going to be salient throughout this discussion. I want to, um, I want to introduce uh, Franklin, Franklin Baker, who's the president and CEO of the United Way of Central Ma Maryland. Uh, Franklin, can you speak a bit about uh, part, the importance of public-private partnerships and how you prioritize COVID-19 relief and perhaps touch upon some of the themes that Daniel just mentioned about the importance of learning together, the importance of acting on bold ideas and working with existing infrastructure to carry out um, the, the, the swift relief efforts uh, for Central Maryland. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, as was shared during our prep meeting, there's probably no thunder to be stolen uh, because all of us have been doing very similar work from the mayor to Daniel to my colleague Milton and Atlanta, all of us have been doing very similar work. So for our participants, uh, repetition deep is the impression. So deep in your impression as you hear today. Uh, as we do with most crises, uh, the United Way of Central Maryland, uh, we really built the strategy. Um, and we continued, as Daniel said, to look at the infrastructure that was in place at the time to really help individuals, but also families, right, affected by COVID to effectively do four things really, respond, recover, rebuild, and the last R really is reimagine. So as we're going through the process of immediate need, as we're helping people to recover from the coming tsunami of evictions, et cetera, as we're focusing on rebuild as a longer term strategy, how do we rethink the age old practices, right? 
in this novel uh, environment we're in. So all of our actions really were aimed at allowing us to proactively, and I love that word, Daniel, proactively aid our community, right? In dealing with the immediate midterm and long-term effects of this unprecedented pandemic. And I know all of the panelists would agree, this truly has tested our resolve, our agency, right? Our commitment to this, not only in the short term, to support pantries, to support mental health and other issues that are emerging, but also our commitment long-term. So for us, between standing up our own COVID uh, community fund and creating two funding collaboratives involving 22 community and family foundations, we raised more than $8 million. This is important because this has never really been done in the Baltimore region before. The number is not important because there's some on the panelists who raised three or four times that amount. It's just the idea of this happening in this time with the level of commitment has been incredible. Um, and so the funds were really used uh, to help with a host of the categories you'll hear from the other panelists. Food insecurity, the digital divide is so important, the foreclosure avoidance, uh, lots of nonprofits who needed sustainability during this time. A lot of our key work in neighborhood empowerment was really lifted. Mental health, child and spousal abuse with so many people being close to their family members, having eight to 10 hours of a day in the face of people who they may not see as much during normal times. So we also really were thinking about how do we support employment and the grocery store workers. And so proud of this initiative. It's a key essential uh, worker category that was lifted by the former mayor. We used an intentional, to Daniel's point, equity lens in how funds were distributed and also which nonprofits actually received the funding in our community. And so 242 unique nonprofits were funded and 52% of those nonprofits were led by Black, Indigenous people of color in our community, and 47% of them generated less than $1 million in aggregated revenue for their nonprofit. So very important, uh, about 28% of our folks funded were less than 30 years old. So we also focused on age and how we fund those organizations that are led by people who are younger. We also stood up a separate uh, equity and social justice fund. I know my partner in crime in Atlanta, Milton, did so as well, uh, allowing contributors to really designate con contributions, right, to efforts that were really important to this space. And, and as I wrap up, with our COVID-19 community fund, 65 private companies is a very important piece, right, from the large companies like the Ravens, you know, the one, big, big organization, uh, to other key big companies, to some of the smaller mom and pop shops who were really interested in supporting this and 1046 individuals contributed from five dollars to twenty dollars etc multiple times uh, throughout this process so some key learnings as i wrap up key learnings from this collaborative work is that there was significant knowledge sharing about various nonprofits, which we've not really as united way funded in the past right what synergies we have for significant signature investments outside of this cycle base week by week funding uh, uh, construct and also ways to share resources and really engage in this one resources around sharing data collection concepts research and evaluation and analysis this has been so fruitful with all of these funding partners uh, as we're moving from kind of the recover to the rebuild phase of our initiative. So much more could be said, but I'll stop there, Elena. Franklin, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ellis Carr, who is the President and CEO of Capital Impact Partners. And uh, Ellis, it's the same question in terms of partnership, public-private partnerships, and how you are prioritizing COVID-19 relief. But if you could also speak to that intentional equity lens uh, that Franklin mentioned, I know that that's also very important to Capital Impact Partners. Great, thank you, Elena. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, really appreciate the, the panels that went before me because I'm gonna repeat a number of similar concepts uh, as well. Um, so Capital Impact is a national nonprofit community development financial institution. Uh, we primarily uh, lend, invest, and develop capacity building programs um, to help expand access to affordable housing, quality health care, education, and food supports. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, we, we thought about prioritization very similar, similarly uh, to our, my peers who uh, went before me 
in the three specific categories, relief, recovery, and transformation, and recognizing that organizations require different types of support to respond to their communities. And so from a relief perspective, um, we recognize the need to act fast. So we focused on our existing borrowers uh, and leverage existing partnerships to channel capital supports where they were most needed. Um, from our existing borrowers pr perspective, we proactively reached out to them uh, to help them understand and educate them on the options that they had in front of them. Uh, specifically, we, use, we, we used to, um, connected them to resources um, around how they could get access to PPP funding and other uh, locally set up um, micro grant programs. Uh, and we also um, allowed them to understand how they could access reserves that they had embedded in their loans for operating and working capital and the like. Uh, and lastly, we worked with them to really help them understand what that could look like in terms of modification or restructuring of their existing loans to provide them with some immediate relief uh, that they had. Um, really kind of to support the businesses and nonprofits uh, we also leverage existing uh, initiatives that we have. In DC, uh, we leverage a uh, partnership through the, uh, called the Entrepreneurs of Color Program in DC, which is a public-private partnership engaged to create new pathways um, in the region for, um, to by providing low-cost capital and business advisory supports to entrepreneurs of color to grow and support their businesses and create and build wealth. Um, there, we partnered with two locally based community development financial institutions uh, to channel relief funds to the to locally based small businesses in Washington, D.C., which they were able to get grant uh, funding um, for distressed businesses, as well as to educate them on where they could go to get support. We also launched uh, the D.C. Uh, or DMV Good Food Fund, which is an innovative response fund that provided uh, about $100,000 in rewards to keep partners on the ground to help sustain and stabilize mission-aligned food enterprises um, and also to support the regional food economy as well in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and just to name a few others, in Michigan, we had a number of partners that we worked with. We had a statewide food program called the Michigan Good Food Fund, which we also uh, channeled both micro grants to them um, and through our partnerships uh, with other locally community-based organizations and CDFIs. And also lastly, we provided kind of residential um, kind of retention support for our colleagues in, uh, in uh, the Midtown Detroit area to ensure that they had, um, so that we could help lessen the housing burden that they were, were coming upon. So that, those were a, just a quick synopsis of how we looked at kind of the, the immediate relief efforts, but we also recognized as many others did that recovery was, um, was needed as well. So we used this as an opportunity to kind of see those and accelerate those things that were already in place or already, we were already working to develop, but also just to accelerate them because we realized in times like this that many financial institutions are stepping back or even pausing and we needed to lean in further. And so we created a rapid response fund in California to really help to support and accelerate the growth in telehealth and telemedicine for community healthcare clinics in California with a number of partners. We um, launched a diversity and development initiative in Detroit, which is focused on increasing the number of diverse uh, real estate developers who can help influence and change the built environment in Detroit by providing low cost capital for real estate developers, particularly at this time. And lastly, we uh, announced um, a partnership with the largest mission-based small business lender in the country, coming together with Capital Impact to form an alliance that will help provide holistic community and economic development at scale and uh, nationally across the country. We're initially starting out in the DMV, Detroit, and LA, but want to take that on broadly across the country in partnership with other organizations. And so. I'll pause there, uh, and Elena, in, in response to your last question, just say that we have uh, put equity at the center of all our work going forward, and we recognize that the reason that um, our communities are in the, the state that they are in um, is because of systemic um, racism uh, and, and policies that have held um, our communities back. And it, unless we really focus our efforts, on the root causes uh, of that created created these issues, we'll continue to talk about these for the next 30 years. 
And so for us, equity and justice have been at the center of our work and we use finance as a way um, to help enable that. Thank you so much, Ellis. And uh, turning to our, our next speaker, um, we have Pamela uh, Lewis, who's the director of the New Economy Initiative. And I, I, Pam, I'm hoping that you will also speak to some of the themes that Ellis raised in terms of leveraging the, the existing infrastructure, but also um, going, trying to go beyond and provide more information about how to ac access relief efforts that might not otherwise get to uh, our communities or the communities of color that each of us serve. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, this is quite a group here to learn from and hear from, and I'm happy to be a part. My comments are focused on the impact of COVID on the smaller small businesses in Detroit. So I'm honing right in on that slice. And I think it's important to understand that of the 60,000 businesses that make up Detroit small businesses, 51,000 of them are minority owned. Um, and then most of those have less than five employees and most of those have no relationship with a commercial bank. So you can assume that when the CARES Act uh, thinking was happening, we knew that many of the Detroit businesses were probably going to get missed um, from efforts such as that. But I'm taking a small slice of Detroit efforts that dealt with health and human services, testing, and all the things that my colleagues have talked about that include a lot of different partners. But the new economy initiative, because it may not be so obvious what we are, uh, we're a strategic grant making initiative, one of the largest and longest running ones in the country, funded by national and local funders like Kresge and Ford, Knight Foundation, Wilson Foundation, and the like. And our whole mission has always been for the last eight years, how do we build a network of support for entrepreneurs and small businesses that really lower the barriers to those underserved entrepreneurs so they can get access to capital resources and networks. And fortunately, uh, during this unfortunate situation of the pandemic, uh, this network of organizations that we've been making grants to, we're able to activate in a way that could provide supplemental assistance to the smaller small businesses in our city because philanthropy had already helped to fund this network through NEI. We had the relationships and trust to engage in that and we were able to work to make some, some level of impact. So when you think about the grantees of NEI, I'm talking about microfinance institutions, CDFIs, incubators, accelerators, etc. Um, and so what happened when the pandemic hit, we, uh, as a grant maker and convener, um, had some decisions to make, particularly understanding that the, the CARES Act dollars probably were going to miss most of our businesses. The first one was to focus slowly, solely on the smaller small business. You know, small business category is up to 500, but the average small business in America is under 10. But we, so we honed it on two to 50 uh, employees with an emphasis on those owned by key people of color, and also expand it beyond just brick and mortar. Because as, as Ellis and Franklin and others mentioned, you know, a lot of the executive orders drove uh, support from the state just to brick and mortar businesses, but there's so many service businesses and home-based businesses that we knew still needed help. So we wanted to be additive and complementary to what the state and the feds were doing uh, by providing uh, stabilization capital uh, through grants to these businesses. Um, we also did activated loan and rent relief programs uh, instead of focusing on deferment programs, working with our grantees who are CDFIs and microfinance organizations to buy down and pay uh, the loan notes for six months for all of the businesses that were in their portfolios, which made up that particular group was about 300 or so. And most importantly, we put ourselves in this position to be this conduit to funding for those nonprofits that understood the needs of the small businesses that they were working with and our philanthropic funders who wanted to do something. And so they, were, they had a very accelerated way of working with us as we were innovating with our grantees and activating these interventions and then going to our group of funders and being able to mobilize about $5 million uh, within weeks that were uh, converted to grants that went to 20 organizations that could do these um, interventions that touched about 2,000 small businesses. 
And one of the last decisions we made, uh, and this is where the whole cross-sector coalition conversation starts, uh, the work that I've been doing has really been heavily uh, a coalition around philanthropy. Um, but this moment, and we've been, this moment really caused us to rethink how we even joined the table of the mayor, the private sector, uh, other nonprofits like Detroit Future Cities and others to take on how do we support small businesses because we knew what we were doing. We may touch 2000, but that still pales compared to the need. And so the Detroit Means Business Coalition, which was a, is a public, private, nonprofit, and philanthropic coalition that was formed, um, led by the mayor, uh, DTE Energy, um, and others uh, on the nonprofit and philanthropic sector, have been doing a lot of work to distribute PPE, um, make a very easier point of contact for businesses to find resources, whether it's financial assistance or technical assistance, et cetera. And so, you know, I could go on and on like others, um, but all that to say, even though it sounds like there's a lot of momentum and a lot of movement and people are coming together, I'll be remiss in not saying that the need is still so great that um, we all need to do so much more. Thank you, Pam. And now I'll turn it to Milton J. Little Jr., who is the president and CEO of the United Way for Greater Atlanta. Milton, can you speak to your partnership efforts and your prioritization for COVID-19 relief, please? Sure. Since you won't ask me, you won't allow me to say ditto, uh, I'll have to come up with, uh, with something we're excited about. Uh, we've done um, all the things that uh, previous panels have talked about. We launched a partnership with the Community Foundation for Greater uh, Atlanta in March over a, uh, a five-minute phone call, uh, and within about a month and a half had raised uh, close to um, $25 million uh, through that work. We had an additional five from other philanthropic sources. And uh, we now are leading the city of Atlanta's efforts around uh, eviction prevention. Uh, that's $22 million of CARES money. So by the end of this calendar year, there'll be $50 million of COVID related uh, money that's flowing through uh, United Way of Greater Atlanta. Uh, focused on a variety of issues, uh, whether it's food insecurity or um, uh, emergency financial assistance or the health issues uh, that the mayor, uh, former mayor, talked about. We've touched all of those uh, issues. Um, we have, the partnerships were incredibly important. Our first three donors uh, of the first three, two of them were private companies. Uh, so we started the fund within a matter of two days with two and a half million dollars um, and most of that coming from the private sector. And that's only continued. Uh, all total, about 50 corp companies and foundations have uh, invested uh, in the fund. Uh, if you pay any attention to the headlines here in Georgia, here in the Deep South, you know we're not ready to talk about recovery yet. Uh, we're, we're not in a position to do any pivoting other than to pivot to the next emergency uh, need. Um, we are still struggling with food insecurity. We're still struggling with uh, access for uh, K-12 students to hardware and, uh, and internet access for their online uh, education. When the last school year ended, there were probably 20% of all of the kids across Greater Atlanta who had not I logged on to one instructional day. Uh, the COVID slide, the educational COVID slide for Greater Atlanta was about two years. And so we are starting behind the eight ball. We are two years behind where we had been uh, through all of the educational progress that has been, uh, has been made. We too had seen so many of the small businesses um, ignored by um, the PPP program and a portion of the funding that we had uh, secured had gone to those technical assistance and capital providers who could provide some assistance uh, to small businesses. We put a particular uh, lens on um, equity uh, early on in, in two ways. One, we had created um, a body of work over the last five years that had really been focused on ending disparities, wealth, and other disparities in greater Atlanta. We created something called the Child Wellbeing Index, which could measure down to the zip code how children fared across 14 different indicators. 
So that index gave us a quick way to look at the zip codes where we knew the priorities were going to be. Uh, none of the issues related to health surprised us. Uh, we had been doing a lot of work in those areas, so we knew which providers to be able to go to. So you talk about existing infrastructure. There's a lot of stuff that had happened uh, over the years that we could just plug into. One of the things that was important about the partnership with the Community Foundation is that the United Way covers 13 of the Metro Atlanta uh, counties. The Community Foundation covers 23. So we were together around who do you invest in in all 13, but we had to rely on our partners at the Community Foundation to give us insight into who were the other uh, major players in those other counties we had no familiarity with that could do the work that needed to be done around the priority areas uh, that, we had, uh, that we had focused on. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to focus on really is the uh, eviction uh, prevention uh, work. Uh, I'm excited about it, but I am daunted uh, by it. The city of Atlanta uh, estimates that there are 14,000 households in the city that are at risk of eviction. The $22 million of CARES money, while it sounds like a lot, is going to cover at least, well, maybe a mo little more than 7,000 of those households. That leaves 7,000 folks that we're not going to be able to touch with these uh, resources. The estimate for Greater Atlanta is that there are 150,000 people uh, who are at risk of uh, eviction. So we have a huge uh, problem uh, facing us. And I keep reminding folks, just because there's a moratorium doesn't mean you don't owe the money. It just means the sheriff's not going to come and take your stuff. Uh, and so we are having to work extremely hard to make sure that folks don't let an arrearage grow to the point where even the CARES money can't help them. Uh, and so that's probably the biggest concern that I have uh, amidst all of the shared concerns uh, that, uh, that my colleagues here on the panel have, have talked about that are burning platform issues for all of us in Greater Atlanta. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Milton. I'm going to turn to Carmen James Randolph, who is the Vice President of Programs at the New Orleans Foundation. Uh, and Carmen, I'm hoping you can speak a bit to some sectoral specific strategies uh, that you have worked on in a public-private partnership fashion. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation and for this opportunity to be on this incredible part, uh, on this incredible panel with um, such experts from around the country. Um, again, I'm with the Greater New Orleans Foundation, and I think first I want to frame how we have been responding to COVID-19. Um, we've been doing so within the context of disaster. And here in New Orleans, um, I would say since Hurricane Katrina, uh, the Greater New Orleans Foundation has been acutely aware of our need to be prepared for disaster and the need for us to look at how we respond to disasters. So about three years ago, we had put in place um, a disaster strategy that was grounded in racial equity, in resiliency, so building back stronger than before, in sustainability, really focused on the sustainability of the um, nonprofit sector, and civic engagement, giving, making sure that people had voice in the process of determining how their communities came back. So this is the frame for our disaster grant making, and we also have done so in a way in which we've educated our donors that um, most of the needs come in the immediate days of a disaster, but we know that often disasters take weeks, months, even years. In our case, we are still in different stages of recovery from Katrina um, for, to come back. So we grant about 60% of the funds that we raise for our disaster fund in those immediate days following a disaster, in the days, weeks, months. And um, we reserve about 40% for long-term support. So we are, have been responding to uh, COVID within that 
framework. I will say we also pre-register nonprofits to receive grants from our disaster fund. So when a disaster strikes, we're able to turn around grants within um, 24 to 36 hours of a disaster being declared. Um, and, and I'm saying that for a reason. So here we have COVID-19. Um, many of the groups who were responding immediately, especially um, I've heard some of my colleagues talk about the issues of food security and so on and so forth. We, we anticipated those being challenges. We were able to make grants within 36 hours, nonprofits had them because we do it electronically of the declaration in our community. Um, but COVID-19, as we all know, is different. We are really still in phase one of response. This doesn't have a very defined period of, you know, the like for instance, in the aftermath of a storm where you're gutting and mucking and doing recovery, and then it's rebuilding. We are still in those early stages, uh, just still in the early part of the recovery um, uh, from COVID-19. And we work very carefully with our government. So we are in partnership with our state um, Office of Homeland Security. We're, we are in close um, partnership with our New Orleans Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. And we're communicating with, we have parishes here in Louisiana, with those parish leaders in our surrounding parishes to get a handle on what the needs are, how we can coordinate support, and how our grantees who are often not just responding in one place can be deployed in um, other places uh, throughout the region. And in this case of COVID, uh, a couple of things that we've learned. Um, one is that um, in terms of the funds that we have for, we were able to um, activate our disaster fund and have partners from our local United Way to um, local funders as well as national funders um, contribute to that fund and individuals. But it was through partnerships with, for instance, like PepsiCo, we were able to give some very targeted and, and um, deeply needed support to address issues like health inequities. Um, the long-standing health care inequities that we've had in our community, um, COVID has just like other disasters has just exacerbated those inequities. Um, many of you know our, our economy here is uh, tourism driven we are a hospitality um, driven city. So um, I will join workforce development meeting next, uh, later this week, but at our last um, meeting of our workforce development board, we had had, we had, had 78,000 um, applications for unemployment um, in that month. So uh, the impact in terms of how many people are out of work is profound. And it's important to know that these folks haven't just lost their jobs, they've also lost their health insurance. So one of our strategies has been to work very deeply with our federally qualified health centers um, because it's our FQHCs and we have FQHCs in um, neighborhoods throughout New Orleans and going out into the region they're the ones who are seeing, um, they were telling us as early as early uh, April that they were already having an uptick in how many folks were coming in um, who, were not who were not insured and also an uptick of how many folks were coming in not only needed testing but also had mental health um, challenges and, and needed mental health care. Um, so we have partnered with about four FQHCs, which between the four of them serve about 125,000 people um, and, and counting. That's, that's at last um, that I've talked to, um, with those folks. As a strategy of, of helping people not only get care um, to improve their ability to provide telemedicine and not make telemedicine something that also didn't become something that um, 
was a was a, a privilege of those with um, resources. For instance, uh, I remember our one um, uh, FQHC uh, president said, you know, if you if Grandma has a flip phone, we can we're limited in how much telemedicine support we can give Grandma if she needs help. Um, because we can't assume that everyone has a smartphone or an iPad or um, a computer at home to participate in a solid tele telehealth visit. So anyway, we have been working to help um, increase their capacity to do that as well as to do testing. Um, we've also have partnered with um, our, our local mayor's office to look at boosting testing support um, to help our schools come back online, to provide rapid testing um, and urgent testing when someone is developing symptoms, whether it's a teacher or a student. Um, and I would say in terms of some of our other public-private partnerships, um, we've had corporate um, partners, uh, some led by our board from the, the Saints, from the Tabasco Company, and um, also the Crystal Company. So we love hot sauce, and we're thrilled that those folks have, have jumped in to support through um, an employee assistance fund that has supported uh, hospitality and service workers with families. And through that fund, we've, we have supported nearly 2,000 families in um, our region with grants to the family of $1,000 each. And I will tell you that one thread of work has, um, and we keep that fund open. We've, we've continued to raise support for that fund. We keep that fund open. And as this disaster, as this pandemic has um, continued, the stories that we are getting from individuals um, are becoming more and more desperate. So in terms of people being months behind on their rent, um, I can tell you that process is, is, is tough for my staff. Um, this, this last bunch, for instance, there was someone who wrote that they have cut their HIV meds in half, um, hoping that they can make their HIV meds last for two months since they don't have a means of, of paying their co-pays now. So, you know, and it's one thing for us in philanthropy to work primarily with nonprofits, but through this program, we've had the opportunity to have a lens into what individual people are, are working with and working through. Um, and to see mothers with three children, head of household, making $9 an hour, um, and collecting food and um, getting food stamps, um, needing assistance. Honestly, it makes you realize how criminal it is that we have people working so hard for so little. Um, and so this disaster of poverty is something that is with us and it's only exacerbated by COVID-19. And in our area now, we are currently responding to COVID-19. We're responding to Hurricane Laura. We have 12,000 evacuees in our city from Laura. Um, and we have Sally, which we're hoping, we're told it's tracking east of New Orleans, but we'll still have some impact probably with flooding and um, possible power outages. But um, it's how we look to respond to multiple disasters at one time. And these issues of migrating for climate, um, th th these are all posing some tough issues for us to look at how creatively we work um, together in partnership because um, this, call, this call is so poignant. We can't all, none of us are doing this work by ourselves. And I think that that is a very important point to underscore. These problems are too huge for any one entity to try to tackle on their own. And this has been an all hands on deck year. So I'll conclude with that. Carmen, thank you so much. And you raise um, such important and some additional points, I, I think, about how these partnerships can reinforce the um, availability of tools like telemedicine or like 
uh, helping to eliminate the digital divide and also thinking very intentionally about the individual sectors that um, help run your city and who's going to need that support no matter how hard they're working they will still need additional support and services in this time and um, I'd like Joanne uh, Stately who is the director of impact strategy economic vitality um, at the Minneapolis Foundation to speak to her experience um, with COVID relief particularly uh, given some of the turmoil that Minneapolis has faced in recent weeks. Well, thank you so much for being able to be part of this distinguished panel and hearing some very similar stories uh, that we've experienced here at the Minneapolis Foundation in the city of Minneapolis, in the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm getting some ideas just by some of your comments and thinking, oh, I think we should be able to think about some of these as we go forward in this uh, opportunity to really provide direct support to our communities. So first, when you asked about the question, who are our partners? Our critical partners first are, are those nonprofits, those organizations that are on the ground, the people that do the work, the people that know how to address critical issues such as this. It's, we can't do this work without them. Uh, so we're kind of a conduit to the, to the work that they're trying to do on the ground. So the nonprofit entities that have been mentioned before, the, the organizations that we've been in relationship through our equity lens that we've, that we've been focusing on for the last 10 to 15 years have really helped to you know, seed and establish relationships so that we could be in a quick response in dealing with COVID. In addition to our nonprofit partners, our other philanthropic partners in the community. We have a number of foundations, a number of nonprofits that do regranting that are in conversation and when COVID hit, a number of organizations and other foundations got together and we're very, very thankful for our Minnesota Council on Foundations uh, who brought this conversation forward among all philanthropy to how we were gonna address COVID across the state and creating a partnership through the, the St. Paul and Minnesota Community Foundation created a fund that was going to, to provide dollars to support other intermediaries across the state to address COVID. Uh, $11 million was raised very rapidly. Uh, a number of funders, and we were a participant in that, <clears throat> helped to uh, look at guidelines to make sure that BIPOC communities, tribal communities, smaller communities were gonna have access to these dollars. And that basic needs through intermediaries were gonna be defined by those entities themselves. We're not, we were not gonna create those definitions uh, for them. In addition to that, we had uh, also a relationship with the, the Greater Twin Cities United Way, as well as the Minneapolis Foundation and the St. Paul Foundation, who also wanted to do some very specifically targeted funding uh, to address COVID that was gonna focus on BIPOC and small businesses. And again, they are working with intermediary groups that are already, much like in Detroit, it sounds like, had these relationships with those businesses. And we were talking small businesses and how we could get direct dollars out rapidly, quickly, to directly help provide with cash to support those businesses, the business owners uh, and employees to do that. And then we had our own initiative at the Minneapolis Foundation and it's called our One Minneapolis Fund, which was created about a year ago that was specifically designed to be responsive and align with kind of the mission that we had at the Minneapolis Foundation. Our partners, and if we talk about partners, um, we really look to our donors when we talk about the Minneapolis Foundation as also being part of those partners. And we have uh, donor advised funds. And when we work with our philanthropic advisors and ask them to talk to them about what's happening in COVID, what the need is to respond first for that basic need request, which we focused on in March, kicking that off. Uh, and, and also then with individuals outside of the foundation and their ability to contribute, uh, we, we raised about two and a half million dollars very quickly. We instituted a very rapid response, not just what our usual catchment area is, which is the city of Minneapolis. We expanded it to the whole seven county area and, and allowed for, again, individuals to define in those organizations what does basic needs mean to them? What do they need? Emergency response, PPP, helping businesses, working with um, uh, domestic abuse projects, food, we talked about food insecurity, the whole gamut uh, was available for people to apply for funding, which also created um, more relationships for us that we didn't necessarily have before to think about this on a more regional effort. And then with our own effort for the One Minneapolis 
fund, we, we, we continued that work on the basic needs, but then shifted after four rapid grant rounds starting in March <clears throat> and wrapping up by the end of May from basic needs to thinking we had a very unique experience with the murder of George Floyd and that we really needed to concentrate on supporting those small BIPOC businesses along those three major quarters that re received enormous amount of damage. They had already been impacted by COVID and now they had to think about rebuilding in a totally different way. And that specific effort raised another two, two, two million dollars. And these were all dollars that came from corporations who are our partners that are out there. Again, individual donors outside of the Minneapolis Foundation, making it easy for them to give uh, and, and our internal donors as well. Um, so we just kind of wrapped up that last round last week to get another two million dollars out there. Now we did it both ways. Uh, we did a rapid deployment uh, to some of our key intermediaries to work with small businesses and just said, here, we're going to give you $100,000. They didn't know about it. They just got the call. I, we said, we knew you, you're looking at issues of your own capacity. Use these dollars to the best way possible. And by the way, come back and apply when we actually open up this process. So I think being nimble and responsive, and for us, some of the things that we did is we really fast-tracked this in a way we've never done it before. Not 24 hours or 36 hours, I'm very envious of that, but we were turning these over in four and five days and reviewing applications on, on a, almost a daily basis. We also really streamlined the application process, removed any type of barriers that we've heard about before on our applications and how for people to access those individual funds. Uh, and also, I think the question is, how do we make sure we're funding smaller entities? That is really part of our lens and how we do our work. We want to know which communities are they specifically serving, which communities are not being served, and who do we need to reach out to? What does small mean when you're talking about small nonprofits and working with small businesses? To also what does large mean with some of those longer term or 20 year intermediary organizations that have been led by people of color and, and serving those communities for a number of years? Uh, we've also learned that a small grant can be as impactful as a large grant. And that really is, again, up to those nonprofits who may say, I really need something different with my technology to better get this information out. Um, so we look at everything kind of just by project, not across, you have to fit this criteria, but what are you saying with each of your individual applications? And then I do want to talk a little bit about government. I mean, when we created these funds and participating with these other collaboratives, we really knew that government it was going to take some time. So we really didn't have a necessarily heart to heart, a lot of conversation with our government entities, uh, but certainly have had those relationships in the past. And actually our, our president reached out to our mayor of Minneapolis at the very beginning of this and just said, whatever you need, let us know. So the, the city of Minneapolis is creating a fund that's going to represent other communities. Uh, people from the community are going to make decisions about how they're going to distribute dollars that are being raised for this fund. And it's a, it's, I think it's a $25 million goal that they have. But as a community foundation, we have tools. We can set up funds. We can direct things very specifically. But at the same time, we can also provide that broader look that tends to overlook areas that may be amiss. And the one thing I liked about our first deployment on basic needs is that we were very kind of encouraging to let people know that these were for the unusual as aspects, if you want to call of providing support to our community. We did specifically identify gig workers as part of that to provide support to. Um, we talked about multicultural kind of aspects of how we we're supporting families when we're talking about a number of our families live together. It's grandma to grandpa to the youngest child and what that impact may be even working with artist groups and supporting the local arts and particularly arts in, in our BIPOC communities and helping to provide some relief and actual dollars to support their workers who were now not eligible, weren't eligible for unemployment necessarily and helping to provide a gap. And finally, then I want to talk about one kind of unique relationship. Uh, we serve as a fiscal agent for what's called the Northside Funders Group. And North Minneapolis was one of those areas that was severely impacted as a result of the riots. But even prior to that, they were raising funds to provide businesses as a part of COVID. Uh, we assisted with uh, that, fight, that, that fiscal agent agreement to allow them to create a platform for giving. And after the, the, the riots and the death of the murder of George Floyd, 
by providing that access to them, that entity, along a partnership with the West Bright Area Coalition, was able to raise over four million, I think it's four million dollars now. Um, so again, just using what we have available for tools to support the community is also kind of important in thinking about this work as we go forward. And then finally, recovery and basic needs, and you've heard this before, is part of that initial kind of response. Um, but we also know that we have this other type of response to be prepared for. So all the money that has been raised, it's you know been raised as additional dollars with our dollars being part of that, but we're, we're moving into our unrestricted grant making round and you know shaping that and how that is going to continue to provide the necessary support, particularly as a result of COVID. And we don't know what's going to happen next either. So we're, we're trying to be mindful of that. We're trying to continue to support the clauses that are out there, continue to engage with various partners to let them know that it's very important for them to contribute uh, not to us, but to others and to many during this process, and also really encouraging direct support going to those nonprofits uh, that we know are doing this work um, in a very, very purposeful way and an impactful way across our community. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Joanne. So we are at the portion where I'm supposed to ask you a few questions. We're running a bit out of time. So I am going to ask, I'm going to put our foundation representatives in a bit of the hot seat. Um, part of the theme that we've heard over and over again is the importance of moving swiftly and of leveraging existing networks. That there's existing infrastructure that you had to work with and through in order to get um, necessary funding out the door. Is there the potential of barrier to entry? Um, and uh, are you guys thinking about that as you move forward to recovery? So for example, I'm thinking about organizations in neighborhoods that may have quote unquote less capacity, or in my opinion, have full capacity, but be more informal networks and informal leaders and still ha have a constituency that they serve, um, but may not have been the first entities that you thought about working with in, in um, getting relief funds or getting, getting relief measures out the door. Can you, can you speak to that issue a bit? Um, I'm gonna, I'll start with Daniel uh, with Chicago Community Trust. Um, and then we can move on to um, to Carmen with the Greater New Orleans Foundation, and then to Joanne uh, with the Minneapolis Foundation. And then we have we'll have one question from the audience before we wrap up. Well, Elena, um, so thank you for that question. It's actually a really important one. So the, the answer is yes. There we do run the risk of the barrier to entry question because. Um, at many of the civic tables that have been set historically in Chicago, community, so I'm talking about, um, particularly black and brown folk in the city have not always been at those tables, right? And so we, we are being intentional about, um, while we leverage existing tables, creating new tables and creating the capacity for community to set those tables, if you will. Um, prior to the pandemic, prior to the social unrest, the trust had authorized a new strategic vision. Part of that vision um, includes a portfolio that I head up called Building Collective Power. And the premise of Building Collective Power, again, this is ahead of the pandemic, was to invest in civic infrastructure that exists at the community level so that um, residents, of, uh, particularly Black and Latinx residents, could um, a, set their own tables, develop their own agendas, and act on those agendas. And, and we were very intentional about putting philanthropy in, in the position, meaning the Chicago Community Trust, in the position of responding to what we heard from communities. This moment, quite frankly, um, underscores the importance of that work, but it actually motivates us to accelerate the, the work at the ground and making sure that we use our convening power to make sure those grantees that are doing that work are at these larger, broader civic tables across every sector. Um, and again, as we develop the recovery funds and we sort of build on all of the momentum that's been created as part of the response, um, we're keeping that um, front of mind. Um, and again, as I see it as my personal responsibility to constantly ask the question, who's making this decision? Um, who's setting this table? 
Um, and is, is the decision making actually connected to real people, particularly folks who've been harmed historically by systemic racism? Um, I mean, and, and we have to, as philanthropy, sort of own that responsibility. Thank you for that. Um, an important gut check. And uh, Carmen, do you want to take a second to respond to that? And then I'm going to ask uh, Molly, actually, if, if there are uh, questions from the audience, a question from the audience that we can share before we have to bring our conversation to a close. I would just quickly say this is where um, partnerships with uh, local government and community is so important and partnership with other funders. Um, for instance, we, um, our staff uh, co-chaired the food security task force in the city. It was through this work that we had a really good understanding and grounding of the landscape of what was happening in food security. And one grant that we supported was um, a project that um, was started by young African-American men in the lower nine um, to help feed seniors. This is their work, their nonprofit, we was, have never been on our radar had we not been at this table. So I think having the, the partnership um, in your community is vital to having a sense of what, what work is happening on the ground and truly having impact in community. Thank you for that. And Molly, do you mind, I'll turn it over to you really quickly. I know that there are questions coming in from the audience, the viewing audience. Uh, can, you, can you maybe summarize one or two of them by theme for our panelists? Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. This has been a wonderful conversation. Pam, I'm actually going to come to you first with a question that talks about how you demonstrate impact. Because we know while it's important to move fast right now, that doesn't change uh, or eradicate the burden to be able to demonstrate impact to funders and donors. Do you have any tips or tools that you'd like to share with the audience? That's a great question. Um, we, we demonstrate impact along a number of ways. Part of it is activity, but the other part is based on outcomes, right? So one aspect of it is who's getting the money? How are money, how are dollars being moved? What are the organizations that are getting those dollars and who are they actually serving? We do ask the question, if you're helping a small business, what does that owner look like? Is that owner a woman? Is that owner a person of color? Is it an immigrant? Um, but the other thing we're also looking at along those same lines, when you're talking about business growth, um, who's leveraging that capital, not just who's getting assistance, but who's also getting capital. Again, what does that owner look like? And then how are they leveraging that? And how are those businesses growing? Um, and how are those businesses impacting their communities? So, you know, we follow a little bit of the same lines as traditional economic development. Where we depart is when we talk about the whole notion around culture change and who's involved. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, Adding jobs can be done in a lot of different ways, but creating a path for an individual that doesn't necessarily have education and access to strategic networks to start and grow a business to develop wealth for their own family is a measure that's sometimes hard to, to quantify. Uh, but if we're engaging with our community development organizations and equipping them to also be a concierge for small businesses in their neighborhoods, if we're making sure that we understand the trusted connectors, the National Business League or Global Detroit, who has relationships with immigrant entrepreneurs, if we're engaging with those organizations, we also believe we're influencing um, the culture in terms of who's seen as being deemed worthy of being supported in order to start and grow a business. That's so helpful. So it's not just measuring the person at the other end of your relationship, it's measuring the people in their sphere. And I think exactly. that's what Dan said about making sure that we are all at the table. Um, very quickly, uh, one other question, and I'm going to come to Franklin, and then Milton, and then Ellis. And I'm going to ask you to give me a, a quick, like, three-word answer. We've got a lot of people watching today that could be donors and, and are interested to know what they can personally do at a time like this. So if you were to advise a donor or an individual looking to act who's listening right now, what subject area, what what issue area should they invest in? Franklin, I'll start with you. So if that donor were interested in investing in greater Atlanta, it would probably be food and security <laughs> <laughs> because of Milton pounding the pavement today about the importance of staying in the response phase, not even pivoting to the recovery or rebuild phase. But if they're in the greater Baltimore uh, region, I would say, to be quite honest, it would be the digital divide. 
uh, it's such a huge issue for us, a massive public school system. Uh, the CEO of our public school sits on our board, so constant conversations with her on need and gaps. Uh, not even talking about the public charter schools as well as the private schools, there's a lot of needs. So I'd say that. That's really helpful. Thank you, Franklin. Milton, what would you add besides food insecurity in Atlanta? I'd say we've got to continue the work to uh, end educational disparity. We still have too many kids that are, uh, that are failing in school and unable to uh, access their online education, and we need solutions to that. That's incredibly helpful and powerful. We can't ignore the thing that has been happening for decades just because we're in a crisis right now. Ellis, I'll wrap with you. What would your advice be? Uh, I would go with uh, small business and healthcare, uh, the two that haven't been said. Uh, small business, you know, is, is a great economic engine for uh, communities across the country, but specifically provide a significant opportunity for communities of color. Um, and I would also just say, given the, the pandemic, the health crisis is one that has been exacerbated and the disparities that uh, we spoke about earlier will continue to happen. And there needs to be more uh, access to opportunity to get quality health care across the country. Thank you so much. And because everyone was so succinct, Joanne, I don't want to leave you out of this last segment. We've heard from everyone else in this part two of the conversation. What would your investment recommendation be? I would, I would continue to encourage people to invest in organizing, community organizing at that grassroots level and, and supporting leadership development within those communities. And, uh, and there aren't enough tables. So I'm not afraid that we have the tables. We need to expand those tables and invest. Thank you so much, Joanne. Elena, I'll come back to you to wrap it up, but thank you to the panelists for indulging me for a minute. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for that fabulous discussion. It was so informative. Uh, I appreciate your thoughtful responses and also just the depth of, of your work. It has, been, it has been a real pleasure working with each and every one of you. I wanna thank um, our, our partners, New America Local uh, and the National Urban League. Uh, thank you, Karen Freeman Wilson for kicking us off. I wanna thank each of our speakers, Daniel Ash, Franklin Baker, Ellis Carr, Milton Little, Pam Lewis, uh, Carmen James Randolph and Joanne Stately. Uh, and, uh, and we want to encourage you all to continue this conversation. So plan to join us again on October 5th, uh, Monday, October 5th, uh, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, 12 to 1, 1.30 Central. Uh, but thank you for joining this discussion about the future of urban America and informing equitable relief and recovery. And thank you for all that you do.